my name is Brett Gardner. I'm a psychologist at the University of Virginia. And I'll be talking about um, some collaboration that we've been doing at University of Virginia with the Houston Forensic Science Center. And Mass and Newman will actually start this presentation. And then you'll hear from me a bit later. Um, but we're looking forward to sharing the results of um, kind of a collaborative research effort here. And Madison, I will let you begin. Okay. Thanks, Brett. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to tell you about this study that I have helped Brett and Sharon with. Uh, my name is Maddie, and I'm a quality research associate at the Houston Forensic Science Center. And a lot of what I do is work on the blind quality control program that HFSC has, and then um, look into latent print analysis research with Brett and Sharon and some other colleagues through CSAFE. So just a brief background on why we're doing some of this research. Um, research examining the efficacy and reliability of latent print examination has expanded in recent years in response to scholars highlighting the need for additional empirical support for many forensic science disciplines, not just latent prints, even though that's what we are focusing on. Two reports uh, with which you are probably familiar are the National Academy of Sciences report published in 2009 and the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Te Technology report published in 2016. Um, there's been growing research on error rates and the influence of contextual effects on latent print analysis, sort of as a result of these reports and reports by other scholars. However, we have found that there is not as much research examining actual latent print casework to first determine typical analytical procedures and outcomes. And at least at the time that we uh, were conducting this research, we found that there were only two studies of real world outcomes in latent print analysis. One of those was by Langenberg and colleagues, published in 2014, titled A Report of Statistics from Latent Print Casework. And I believe that citation is at the end of the presentation if you're interested. And then I actually chose to highlight this second study here by Rare Nadal, published in 2018, Resolving Latent Conflict What Happens When Latent Print Examiners Enter the Cage. And I chose this one because uh, it discusses two trends, excuse me, it discusses trends in two years worth of latent print comparison casework at the Houston Forensic Science Center. Um, so this study is meant to sort of build on that study. So one, a few things that we really wanted to do with the study was to just describe casework completed by latent print examiners in a large forensic laboratory over the course of a calendar year describe the prevalence of examiner conclusions during that year and explore any variation in examiner conclusions according to casework variables. And then lastly, explore the extent to which there are examiner differences in conclusions and case processing. A little bit um, of background about the Houston Forensic Science Center. We are a local government corporation that provides forensic services to the city of Houston and surrounding areas. I would say um, HPD is our Houston Police Department is our primary stakeholder. We have forensic services in crime scene investigation, toxicology, seized drugs, multimedia, firearms, forensic biology, and of course, latent prints. Our laboratory became independent from law enforcement in 2014, April 2014, so we just passed seven years of being independent from HPD. And all the sections, all the technical sections have been accredited by the American National Standards Institute National Accreditation Board, ANAB, since 2015. As for this study, we opted to examine latent print cases reported in uh, the 2018 calendar year. And we utilized data available in Justice Tracks, which is HFSC's primary laboratory information management system. We included only genuine casework and excluded cases from uh, what HFSC calls the Blind Quality Control Program. 
And in total, there were 17 examiners performing casework at this time or who reported cases at this time, 12 women and five men. All were certified by the International Association for Identification and their experience ranged anywhere from five to 36 years. I wanted to include this slide just to show you um, what kind of evidence HFSC sees as far as latent print evidence. There are two main types. What you see on the left here is a latent lift card from HPD. This is actually, both of these actually are examples from our blind quality control program, so not real casework. But I would, um, I've asked this section before, and I bet that they would probably estimate 90 or more percent of casework looks like these latent lift cards on the left. A smaller percentage comes from latent print processing, where physical items of evidence first need to be chemically processed by latent print processors who then photograph any latent prints and then share those images with the latent print examiners through a program called MIDEO. And there's an example of I think that's like a um, plastic fast food container that was processed through the blind program. So because HFSC I know um, is, a, can, is a little bit different from a lot of other laboratories in the country and the world, um, I included this flow chart. Um, I've done my best to simplify the process and I'll spend just a little bit of time explaining each of these steps here. No matter whether the evidence is a latent lift card or an image from latent print processing, the first thing the examiner does is to make a sufficiency determination about any rich detail they see. In 2018, the section had three main sufficiency determinations, no value, not APHIS quality and APHIS quality. A print may be deemed no value, at which point the analysis for that print stops and nothing else happens. A print may be of value, but not sufficient quality for APHIS, for an APHIS search. And third, a print may be of APHIS quality and subsequently searched through APHIS. At this time, the standard operating procedure was to search prints first through the local APHIS, which we call morpho track, but I believe is now called edemia. If no hits were generated at the local level and the crime type is a person's offense, uh, like robbery or homicide, the prints are then searched through um, the state and then federal databases as well. Once searched in APHIS, APHIS returns a candidate list. Examiners use that list to perform an on-screen comparison and can make one of three conclusions, main conclusions. If the examiners does not determine correlation between the searched print and the prints on the candidate list, the examiner can conclude that there's no association and the print is, quote, uh, negative in APHIS. If the examiner does determine that there are corresponding characteristics between the searched print and a candidate on the list, the examiner conclude a, can conclude a preliminary APHIS association or APAA. Um, this is just an on-screen comparison, not conducted against any record prints. So HFSC treats this as an, an investigative lead and is not an official identification. If a print is first searched in APHIS and um, is negative, the print can be registered to the respective APHIS unsolved latent file, a repository for unidentified prints. If APHIS identifies a potential match in the future, the examiner can re-examine re the print for a potential association. And if that occurs, that's what's referred to as a reverse hit. Finally, if a print is found to be a PAA and is given to the stakeholder as an investigative lead, the stakeholder can request a confirmation analysis using full record prints. During this analysis is when the section reports identifications, exclusions, or inconclusives. And in this workflow, only a small amount of PAAs were requested for confirmation. I believe just over 300. However, all of the confirmations did result in official identifications. And I think I saw a question pop up. All right, well, while you're looking at that, 
interrupt me if you want to answer it, but I will go ahead and talk about what we found. So thanks for giving us some context and let's do an explanation for how HFSC works. It's fairly unique in this regard. Um, let's first start with just some broad numbers. So in 2018, the latent print unit at HFSC processed almost 3,000 cases. And related to those cases, they um, performed about 3,200 analyses upon request. The vast majority of these cases related to burglary or theft crimes, robbery crimes, but there were um, a pretty wide ranging uh, variety of offenses. And then like uh, Maddie had said earlier, uh, HFSC uses three different APHIS uh, distant, uh, databases. Um, they start with the county level database no associations, move on to the state level, no associations, move on to the federal level. And um, pretty clearly you can see that, you know, most two out of three searches are occurring on the county level APHIS database. So in total, we found that the HFSC uh, lab examined more than 20,000 prints in 2018. Of those roughly 20,000 prints, slightly under half, about 9,000 were deemed to be APHIS quality prints and were entered into APHIS. Slightly more than half were determined to be of no value and a minority were considered to be of comparison value, but not good enough to be entered into APHIS. And so of an, about 9,000 APHIS quality prints, these prints were entered into an APHIS database about 12,000 times. It's higher because some prints were entered into more than one uh, database. And of those roughly 12,000 APHIS entries, we see that the vast majority did not result in an association. So a take home message here is that we can say that about 22% of APHIS entries actually resulted in a potential association, whether it was a PAA or a reverse hit. And approximately 13% of all prints that were examined in the calendar year of 2018 resulted in a potential association. So we also looked at variability within examiner conclusions and case outcomes. And we found that there was vari variability according to three primary um, variables, offense type, APHIS software and print source. So with regard to offense type, we found that examiners were slightly more likely to conclude a print was sufficient to enter into APHIS when that case involved a person offense. Uh, so a person offense, of course, is um, an offense against a person. So assault and battery, robbery, violence, things like that. Um, and why we can't say much as to why this is, um, you know, just speculating perhaps there is more of a pressure to run prints through when there's an actual um, identifiable victim involved. Uh, we also found that examiner conclusions varied according to the APHIS software used. So on the right here, we have a graph and the green uh, represents the percent of searches that resulted in a preliminary APHIS association. Yellow is the percent that resulted in reverse hit, and the red are all the searches that did not result in an association. And what we see here is that the state level APHIS database is lagging behind the other databases quite significantly. Now, the county level and federal level APHIS databases were about five times more likely to result in a potential association. And this is consistent with just anecdotally polling the examiners. There's a pretty general consensus that they did not like the state level APHIS. Uh, so this result was not surprising to many of them. Uh, and again, there are many potential explanations for this that we'll, we'll talk about later, um, but just this discrepancy as is, is, is noteworthy. And then finally, we saw some variability according to print source. And so here we see, again, this uh, chart is 
um, formed in a similar way. Green represents percent of entries that result in a preliminary APHIS association. And we see that fingerprints and palm prints entered into APHIS databases. Um, about one in four of these fingerprints and palm prints result in a potential association. However, when we submit joint prints or unspecified impressions, this drops down dramatically. We are much less likely to successfully um, find a potential association when we're entering joint prints or other types of prints into APHIS databases. And beyond these sources of variability, um, as a psychologist, of course, we're interested in individual differences. So we looked at the examiner level, um, how much variability is there in day-to-day -day work and outcomes. So on the left, we see case processing variables for 14 of the 17 examiners that submitted cases in 2018. We didn't include three examiners because they didn't work long enough for their results to be meaningful. But what we can see here is that just in terms of productivity, efficiency, some examiners completed about 11 requests per month, whereas another examiner in this case almost completed 46 requests per month. And this also goes, or this is also true when we look at the actual prints that they examined each month. So one examiner only examined uh, 66 prints each month during 2018. Another examiner almost evaluated 300 prints, so 270 prints each month. So there's a lot of variability in how many uh, prints some examiners are churning out. And then we look at sufficiency determinations. So we see here that some examiners are saying about one in three of the prints that I review are of sufficient quality to enter into APHIS. Whereas another examiner is entering um, more than half of the prints that they examine into APHIS. And then finally, looking at variability in the actual conclusions, maybe the most important variable here, we again see that one examiner is saying of all the prints I evaluate, 13% result in an association, whereas another examiner is almost twice as likely to find that the prints that they examine um, are in association. So a lot of variability here, and but the question is why? And unfortunately, we can't speak to that too much, but we will offer some um, speculation or areas for future research on this. So Maddie talked about a study with HFSC case processing data um, that spanned 2014 to 2016 that reared an et al. paper. And so we compared it as best we could with this study. And we found that somewhat surprisingly, the number of cases evaluated during the span of each, stu each study was similar. Um, again, Reardon et al. looked at two years of case, process pro case processing data and we looked at one year and HFSC was actually examining more cases during this one year span. Now, in this case, we actually do have a simple uh, answer for this. During 2018, HFSC was uh, unexpectedly given approximately 2,500 latent print cases by the police department that had previously not been reviewed. So that we just happened to be reviewing a year in which they were slammed with uh, a backlog of cases. So that explains that. But we also see that they had more examiners working at the time. Uh, another key difference between this study and a past study at HFSC was that, as we've talked about, HFSC has implemented these preliminary APHIS associations. This is a pretty big shift from their previous case processing uh, procedures. But despite these differences in standard operating procedures, we see that about 45% of examined prints in each study were ultimately determined to be of sufficient quality for APHIS entry. So there's not a lot of research looking at actual real field data 
but perhaps we're starting to see a pattern where about 45% of prints are deemed um, of sufficient quality to enter into APHIS. And going back to examiner differences, we, the data do suggest that you know, there are meaningful differences in examiners in their sufficiency determinations and ultimate conclusions about whether a print is associated with um, another or not. Of course, an obvious explanation for this would be examiners are not given the same type or amount of cases. Um, relatively senior examiners may be given more difficult cases, more complex cases. Um, so on one hand, this, this may explain some of the differences we see. However, the magnitude of these differences suggests that maybe something else is at play here. So it's also likely that examiners are different in their decision-making tendencies or thresholds. After all, uh, latent print comparison is subjective as hard. Um, people are involved, people are making the decisions. And previous research is consistent in suggesting that sufficiency determinations in particular lack a consensus in the field. And so what does this mean for future research? Uh, what are we hoping to do in the future? Well, these findings identify a, a, a noted lack of research on APHIS databases. Oftentimes we kind of lump APHIS findings and results together and assume that all APHIS systems are the same. However, there are different APHIS algorithms. Um, APHIS databases include different types and amounts of prints. And of course, there are interaction effects. So perhaps the way some examiners mark up prints differently interact with APHIS databases in a different manner. Um, I'd also like to note that these findings are just the work of one laboratory over the course of one year. So this limitation should be noted. Uh, we are now working to replicate these analyses in other laboratories. I think an important contribution of this research is looking at it in the context of other laboratory data. And then we're also um, hopeful that the use of quality metrics to explain variability in these case outcomes might um, be fruitful. Uh, we recently published a study where we found that standardized quality metrics, such as LQ metrics, were significantly associated with sufficiency determinations examiner conclusions, and ultimately examiner accuracy in HFSC's blind quality control program. Um, so just a, a note from that study, we found that good quality prints, quality prints that were categorized as good according to the quality metric, were more than twice as likely to result in a correct conclusion as ugly prints or very poor quality prints. So perhaps uh, much of this variability can be explained and accounted for when we kind of quantify the, the quality or clarity of prints involved in this casework. And then finally, uh, we think that uh, studies like this, these findings go a long way in, in increasing laboratory transparency. There's not a lot of publicly available data about this. Um, even if the data is simple, it's just there's not a lot of it accessible to the public right now. And um, so these findings allow us to say that in this one laboratory over this one year, about half of examined prints were determined to be of some value. About 13% of all examined prints actually resulted in a potential association. But of course, there was noted variability relating to examiner differences, case details, print source, and APHIS database. So I will go ahead and stop here. Um, I got so many screens up, I can't tell if we got questions in the chat or anything. Um, Maddie, have you been keeping track of any questions or anything like that? I have been doing my best, but if I have missed your question, please feel free to unmute and ask out loud. Um, I, uh, Brett, I just wanted to confirm, and I think we're getting kicked out in a minute. Um, a of the 45% that were 
deemed not or um, uh, went into APHIS or they did, but whichever one it is, did that mean all three APHIS systems? Um, Maddie answered the question about some about uh, state, local, local state and national. So did that mean all of them? So Maddie will correct me if I'm wrong. Seconds, yeah. <laughs> if they're found to be of insufficient quality for APHIS entry, they, they aren't entered into any. Um, so it's like kind of a minimum bar. Is it of sufficient quality to be entered? Oh, I see. Yes. Or okay, no. and, and that's an individual decision. And also Mike Walksh asked about objective um, uh, versus subjective. Mm -hmm.